Hello, you're watching the Cloud Native Telco Summit, part of our year-round DSP leaders coverage. I'm Guy Daniels. Now, for an expert perspective on the Cloud Native Telco transformation journey, the challenges ahead and the best approach to take, I'm joined by Vivek Chada, who is SVP and Global Head of Telco Cloud for Rakuten Symphony. Hello, Vivek. Good to see you. Now, despite all our best efforts, there's still industry-wide confusion around the terms cloud, cloud ready and cloud native. Can you explain how these three are different and also outline in terms of architectural changes, what going cloud native entails for telcos? Sure. Uh... Good morning, Guy. Thanks for having me. Um, I think it's a great question to start the conversation. And uh, this is something that actually we were hoping would start getting clearer and clearer as time goes by. And it is, but the pace of the disinformation or confusion, I think, is still something that needs a bit more work. Um, just a bit of historical context. I think when the term cloud native was coined uh, with the best of intentions, in hindsight, it wasn't probably the best choice because if you look at the technology community in, in general, but telcos as well, the word cloud has had mind share over the last 10 to 12 years in such a manner that anything that's prefaced with the word cloud immediately conjures up the public cloud or the hyperscalers. And I think that's partly led to the confusion. Um, cloud, in a very simplistic sense is somebody else's computer. Uh, with the public hyperscalers, you're doing that at scale, so you enjoy elasticity, scalability, etc. Uh, obviously, they've built services beyond the infrastructure layer over the last few years and done a great job of that. But then Cloud Ready is where monolithic applications, which were never designed with a cloud-like infrastructure in mind, were ported or made ready to work on the cloud. This is where the bulk of today's application estate would be and they are compatible with the cloud. So a lot of operators rightfully claim that they are running in the cloud or bits of their workloads. Cloud native actually was the convergence of multiple disciplines that came together. And everything wasn't just the technology. There were things like the CI CD uh, model, uh, microservices as an architectural paradigm. Uh, then we had containerization as a technology. Uh, and a few other things, and they all came together to define what is now known as, uh, or largely known as cloud native. And I think these multiple disciplines started providing a way for operators and businesses to start building applications um, and mission critical solutions, which could leverage the best of what public cloud has had to offer over the last few years, but then also give a lot more control and power to the actual organization in terms of being able to run uh, at the same scale speed and higher sort of flexibility, uh, their workloads either on-prem or on public cloud. Uh, the closest euphemism to this would have been the hybrid cloud, but that had its limitations in how applications could be architected ground up for cloud native um, and what they could achieve in terms of things like auto scaling, uh, auto healing, auto healing uh, resilience, etc. So I think what cloud native has truly done is allowed businesses to stop focusing as much on what I call the digital plumbing and have to worry about every bit and byte and every application having to figure out its own to do resilience and, and, and restoration, etc. Uh, rather, it, if, you, if you make the appropriate choice of the underlying technology platform for cloud native, a really a scalable and a viable cloud native platform should abstract and take away the obligation from the application developers of managing all of this infrastructure and digital plumbing on behalf of the applications. So the consequence of this is both the business as well as the application vendors start putting the best of their intellectual capital into building the best business logic that they can, rather than worrying about how am I going to deal with scaling infrastructure uh, going up, going down, what happens uh, if there's a failure, how do I recover from it, uh, how do I do burst capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some facets which I think define cloud native, which is very different from just uh, the elasticity, scalability aspect of public cloud that we've been used to historically. 
Thanks very much for that, Vivek. But um, can I ask you, are you seeing progress? I mean, is is the message to, as to what cloud native means and entails and what it can bring, is it actually getting through to more telcos, more people in telcos? Are we seeing an improvement? We are, definitely. And I think um, uh, a little bit of nuanced looked at the data is probably useful at this point. Um, Unlike a very formal standards-driven protocol, um, such as three, things that come out of 3GPP or IEEE, etc., Cloud, Cloud Native was an industry informal agreement uh, around converging on a set of practices or disciplines. Um, so the interpretation of Cloud Native is also slightly subjective, depending on which camp you sit in. But largely, there has been consensus. And interestingly, before the telco world really went deep into adopting cloud native. It was the non-telco side, the enterprise side, especially the financial sector actually, who's done a lot more work on cloud native in the past. And actually uh, there are large financial institutions uh, who have actually not just adopted and embraced cloud native, but there are challenger startups coming, uh, FinTech banks, for example, which are completely built on cloud native principles, including core banking, retail, et cetera. And that then brings us to telco. In telco, I think um, the cloud native emergence intersected with uh, two really interesting catalysts. So one was 5G uh, from a timeline perspective and the other uh, is and was ORAN. So what's happening is that when we look at some of these buzzwords and typically the hype cycle of newer technologies or generations in the telco world, there is this expectation of this massive spike in adoption. Uh, that is not yet around the corner, and uh, there is reasons for that. I mean, if I remember correctly, I read a report recently that globally the active 5G population is about 5% uh, of active subs in the world. Uh, that doesn't mean that 5G isn't happening. It just means that it is yet to take off uh, at a scale. And that has one example, an example of a bearing that has on things like cloud native. As you move to a disaggregated architecture, which is where 5G comes in with cups, you are almost forced into thinking about a new way of operating, deploying, running, maintaining, and lifecycle managing your network. But the operator isn't alone in this journey. They do have a dependency on the vendor ecosystem to do the same. So in the enterprise IT world, the vendors have moved a lot faster because the demand was there. In the telco world, that movement has started, I think, roughly two to three years ago. And almost every quarter or two, we are seeing more and more vendors announce their cloud native roadmap in the telco space. So that's an intersection of cloud native as far as 5G is concerned. And then you come to Open RAN, and I think that adds another dimension to this uh, journey and adoption of cloud native because what a standard legacy vertical telco stack in 5G would have done to disaggregation, ORAN takes it to a whole new next level uh, across every layer of infrastructure. And again, you're forced into making sure that your choice of the underlying cloud native platform can provide you with a highly automated, a highly scalable, a very cost efficient way of onboarding, deploying, provisioning, lifecycle managing this estate. And this estate is inherently software centric now compared to 10 years ago, where it was usually boxes and cards from a few select vendors. So it is definitely accelerating. I think the next two to three years is when we will start seeing much more significant take up of this, uh, also because the vendor roadmap will start delivering the cloud native variants of their uh, telco applications. Well, that's very encouraging to hear. So Vivek, how can operators embrace an open and horizontal telecom cloud platform in order for them to achieve this greater flexibility and agility and innovation at scale? And how can cloud native accelerate CSP's transformation to new purposes and roles? So I'll take the second part first, right? So. Cloud Native inherently allows you to, for the first time in the last almost two decades, almost limit to a significant the amount of intellectual effort you spend on managing infrastructure, not just at design time, but also at runtime. So that's the first advantage that you gain, that your allocation of your intellectual capital goes into more business-centric areas which hopefully help you drive better innovation and monetization and customer satisfaction. Um, most of us come from engineering background. Typically, 
any network, not just a telco network or any solution architecture has had to do a bottoms up, including infrastructure. You still need to do that, but you don't need to do it down to the level of granularity you had to earlier in order to achieve scalability, resilience, et cetera. The second advantage that you have when you go to cloud native is that once you've made your selection of your technology platform and your render ecosystem, et cetera, the level of automation you're going to achieve both in terms of onboarding, deploying, provisioning, and lifecycle management is unseen in the telco world uh, in the last two decades. Um, and one of the things that uh, you may have come across, and we've certainly heard a little bit about in the last year or so, is uh, this concept of decloudification. Um, I mean, I've certainly been part of some conversations in Europe, again, both in the telecom, but also the non-telecom segments where some customers, uh, if you will, are looking at the pendulum swinging back a little bit. Um, when cloud, uh, public cloud, uh, uh, as we call it, when that caught the imagination of pretty much every board in the world in the last 10 years, I think a lot of energy and effort was put into moving workloads into the cloud. Um, and as things generally tend to do, uh, there was a bit of an overkill there because even applications which necessarily would have a tipping point beyond which the ROI on the cloud wasn't uh, the best, were moved to the cloud, especially in the case of um, very he heavy data ingress and egress. So there has been some talk about decloudification where customers are saying, well, we definitely do want to keep leveraging the benefits of public cloud, but it's not an all or nothing. And there are certain workloads where we think, or certain use cases where we think uh, it's better to decloudify and bring those workloads uh, back into an on-prem environment. And the on-prem environment isn't necessarily bare metal. It, it's obviously now containerized, cloud native, et cetera. Um, so I think that is another facet to keep in mind that is driving a very serious look and adoption of cloud native where customers, they do understand the skill elasticity benefit of public cloud, but then both for control, innovation, speed, uh, as well as in some cases, data privacy reasons uh, and regulatory reasons, they'd much rather have certain aspects of their workload and estate uh, on their own premises. So once an operator has worked out the, 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 the what and why of cloud native, can you go into a bit of detail about some of the direct gains that they can anticipate by deploying cloud native systems? That's a great question. Um, so I think let's talk money first because that usually gets everybody's attention. So uh, we've seen that from a like to like comparison, uh, both in the telco and the enterprise use cases that we have seen, there is typically an improvement in your uh, asset utilization. So either you can do the same amount of work for a bit less hardware, and that bit less is anywhere from 20 to 30%, or you can have the same amount of hardware and deliver more throughput through it. So depending on what your business profile is looking like, uh, you can leverage a CapEx gain very quickly when you design a cloud native solution and compare it to other legacy or non-cloud native uh, equivalent implementations. This is just at the build time, right? And uh, obviously the amortization effects, et cetera, all kick in. There's associated OPEX benefits of doing this, uh, obviously, because uh, less hardware requires less energy, real estate, et cetera, less manpower to run. Uh, there's also improved MTBF, um, but also on the OPEX side, because if you do, like I mentioned previously, make the right selection of the underlying cloud platform, which not just del delivers cloud native capabilities, but also hyper automation, your OPEX tends to go down in certain cases by as much as 50%. And uh, it's very easily quantifiable because there are various roles and skill sets where you literally see something like a 70 to an 80% improvement in the allocation of those uh, functional uh, roles uh, to the task, thereby freeing up their time to do other things. Uh, or you require a, 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 a lesser amount of skills to deliver similar or even higher throughput. So that's on the fiscal side. So there is a marked improvement in CapEx and OpEx, uh, which is very easily quantifiable. Uh, the second uh, bucket of benefits is related to the amount of resilience you can expect from your architecture. A cloud native solution, if designed uh, carefully, and if the right platform is used to host, run, deploy, manage, and run this uh, uh, solution, you see a marked 
improvement in your ability to do things like auto scale, auto scale in, scale out, uh, but also healing and failover uh, with very minimal to no intervention. The third thing that you can gain a benefit on is uh, truly finding that right balance between the right fit use between cloud, private cloud as well as public cloud. So truly balancing both so that you have direct access control to your core assets and your infrastructure. Uh, and yet you are able to exploit whenever you need an amount of burst capacity or have certain workloads which are better suited just for a public cloud environment uh, run on that, but the rest remaining uh, in your direct control on your private uh, infrastructure, either bare metal or virtual machines. And the fourth advantage uh, is an interesting one. I think it allows you to literally look at a bridge of going from where you are today in your life, uh, uh, which may not be completely cloud native. You may have embarked on cloud native. You may be thinking of going cloud native. Um, and chances are you will have a lot of virtualized estate. You will have some variety of virtualization running in your estate, which is the precursor to cloud native. And uh, till recent past, it's been hard to try and have everything run on converged platform because you have to do the famous six hours, re-architect, re-platform, refactor, et cetera, your virtual machine-based implementations to have them truly be containerized. And that's acted a little bit like, uh, that's added a bit of friction for the businesses to say, well, I don't want to run dual stack or the cost of change is quite high. My VM based vendors are not ready with their CNF, so I'm going to wait. Uh, again, with the right kind of platform, such as SimCloud, you could actually take an existing virtual machine set uh, or VM based set of workloads or VNFs and run them on a single converged horizontal cloud platform, which is cloud native. Uh, with almost minimal to no change in the code uh, by using abstractions that uh, are provided by the platform itself. So what this does, guys, is it allows the business to suddenly accelerate their journey into cloud native by not throwing away anything that they've already invested in, which is their existing virtualized uh, VNS, et cetera, but also not spending a very huge amount of time and money in refactoring these uh, virtualized assets, which are not fully cloud native yet, uh, the other issue is when you do refactor code, you run the risk of inheriting new technical debt. So you don't want to do that, especially when you know in a year or two, you're going to move to the cloud native variant of that network function. So such a converged platform, which allows you to run CNFs and VNFs together uh, with minimal to no interruption or, or change to the VNF, suddenly acts as a catalyst, an operational and a technical catalyst, freeing you as a business to say, well, one of the biggest reasons delaying my decision to go all into cloud native has moved. So I think that's the other benefit uh, businesses have, which is very tangible because it's all about time to market. You've got your CapEx and OpEx, you've got your efficiencies through automation and uh, in terms of improved customer service, uh, customer experience with resiliency, et cetera. And then you've got the ability to actually accelerate your time to market and move into a more consolidated to be architecture uh, which also allows you to switch off legacy uh, licensing platforms, et cetera, and concentrate all your budget into where your future estate is headed, which is hopefully cloud native. So many benefits to cloud native there. We must leave it there for now. Vivek, it's really good talking with you and thanks so much for sharing your views with us today. It's been a pleasure, Guy. Thanks for having me.